David Newman back in the house. This is going to be episode 616. You were here on 371. That was do it marketing, right? Now, now it's do it selling. Is that is that what we're talking about? That is what we're talking about, Wes Schaefer. That is right. why we are here. Welcome back. Well, you know, I um I just I want to go on record. All right. This uh, do it selling. I feel like you're encroaching into my world. So I just wanted to hit record as I deleted this episode, man. I am the sales whisperer. How dare you step into my world? What the what the heck, man? Dude, uh, dude. I just see how much fun you're having and I could not help but jump into the pool. All right. You're right. It is a big pool. It's a, it's a big ocean. It's a big ocean. So that's awesome. So your book is coming out. Um, and I, I, you stuck with the themes, right? Speaking, marketing, selling. Yes. Uh, do it, do it, do it. Hey, and amen. Do it right. Nike got it right. Just do it. Um, but that is easier said than done, isn't it? It sure is. Uh, yeah, you're doing it. You're, you're doing it, though. Why, why are you different? Well, so it's funny. <laughs> the do it selling book came out of the impulse because a lot of my clients, probably unlike some of your clients and listeners, a lot of my clients are professional services sellers and professional services consultants, law firms, consulting firms, agencies, marketing agencies. These people, Wes, they hate to sell. They would rather do anything else than sell. Now, even professional salespeople, sales reps, Sometimes they hate parts of the process, and sometimes they hate the most important part of the process that you and I love and that you help your clients with brilliantly, namely prospecting, prospecting. So another one of our friends in the sales world, um, I think it was Mike Weinberg in his book, New Sales Simplified, he has a great line in there. He says, nobody defaults to prospecting activity. So like if let's say we had canceled this podcast, which I'm really glad we did not, but let's say you got a free 45 minutes on your schedule. I have a free 45 minutes on my schedule. I'm guessing that even though we're both dyed in the wool sales folks, uh, we probably would not go, oh, good. Wes canceled me. Let me go and do 45 minutes of prospecting. Right. So even, even professional salespeople do not default to prospecting activity, yet we all know that new blood is the lifeblood of your sales engine. Yep. Um, and it's true. Yeah, well, you were saying, you know, your your clients hate selling. I I don't think every salesperson, it, it's interesting. I, I talk to people and they constantly push back. Oh, I'm not a salesperson. You know, because I've had services clients, contractors, you know, kitchen and home remodeling. Oh, we're not salespeople. Oh, yeah. Like they, they go, they bend over back and say, well, that's your problem. It's like, if I can fix that attitude, whatever you paid me, you're going to have a positive ROI. Just fixing that one thing. You know, Amen. but everybody's got, a, they have a negative perception of, of salespeople. Yeah. Why Early in the do it selling book, I have a little subsection called loud and proud. Uh -huh. And I, I, what I, what I say is every time that you hear me say the word salesperson or salespeople, I am talking about you and mm -hmm. you are the salesperson in chief of your business. If you're the founder, you're the CEO, you're the president, you're the owner of that you know, kitchen cabinet firm, you're the owner of that consulting firm, you're the owner of that accounting firm, you are the salesperson in chief. And I mean, we're on the same page here, my brother, totally. I said, the moment you embrace that, your entire world will start to shift and your entire set of sales results will also start to shift. Yeah. So I, I do this so often. So I got my little pocket planner here that I got from, oh, this is wonderful. They even notice courtesy of Metropolitan Mortuary, <laughs> but it's a nice little guide. But right there, I wrote the word pushy, right? Because I, I, I do this training so often. I'm like, hey, when you hear the word salesperson, salesman, what words come to mind, right? And, and you'll have like, it's always silence. And then, you know, the positive people go, 
goal oriented service. I'm like, okay, look, your boss isn't listening. What's the real word? And they're like, arrogant. Used car salesman always comes up, you know, and then pushy. I'm like, okay, that's what we think about salespeople, which is why we we bend over backwards saying, oh, I'm not a salesperson. Like, Come on, man, you are in sales, but you don't have to be pushy. Why, but why is there so much negativity around this profession? Well, I'll, I'll do you one better than pushy. Let's talk about the word salesy. <laughs> salesy is never used in a positive sense. No. Oh, Wes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you like $25,000, buddy. I'll, I'll tell you why. You were so awesome. You were so amazing. You were so salesy. It's never a compliment, right? The word itself, when used as an adjective, well, you're being salesy. That's like, oh, you're being slimy, negative, selfish, too much talking, not enough listening, all that jazz. So yep. I'll tell you, let me, let's talk about pushy and salesy and how to diffuse that. Because one of the ideas in the Do It Selling book is that we need to stop talking. When you go into an initial conversation, especially a discovery conversation, uh, people think, oh, I'm going to go in, I'm going to present, I'm going to pitch, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make offers. And I'm like, no, no, and no. You're going to go in and you're going to ask a ton of questions. The very first question you should ask is so tell me a little bit about your professional journey with this problem, this issue, whatever it is that your company's products or services solve. Tell me where you've been, tell me where you are right now, and tell me where you'd like to go. Why is that a great opening question? Because it gets the prospect talking. The moment the prospect is talking, all the pressure is off of you. And now you become a facilitator, you become an interviewer. You become strategically dumb and perpetually curious. Every statement that they make, you've got some follow-up questions. You dig a little bit further. You say things like, tell me more about that. And what else? And where else is that showing up? And how else is that having an impact? And who else is, is impacted by that? So asking all of these questions and taking off your quote-unquote salesy hat and putting on your investigative journalist hat and pretend you're on an episode of 60 Minutes if that helps you, but you are literally probing, peeling the onion, trying to get to the issue behind the issue, the question behind the question, the symptom behind the symptom. And when you're in questioning mode, A, you have all the power, and B, you have none of the pressure. And another sales guru, and I wish I could attribute who it was, but it gets a brilliant quote. Um, and I know that you don't like the word guru because you spell it G-O-O-R-O-O, -O -O, and I tend to agree with you there. So <laughs> it's not a guru, but it was a smart sales expert. He said, a prospect who is listening is not a prospect. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Prospect who's listening is not a pro Oh, oh, a prospect who is talking is a prospect. A prospect who is listening is just saying, how soon can I end this meeting? How soon can I get out of here? I wonder what's on my grocery list. Do we still have juice? Do we need to go get some milk? I, I think tonight's going to be pizza night for the kids. And do not be bloviating on your prospects. A prospect who is listening is not a prospect. Those are some golden words of advice. So the way to ask these questions and the structure and the frameworks I put into the Do It Selling book, I don't believe in scripts because I think scripts tend to make people robotic. I'm a huge believer in conversation roadmaps and structures and frameworks that you can put your own personality into, and then you sell much more naturally and much more organically, and everything is based on questions, and everything is based on really finding out if you and this prospect are a good fit, if you have a reason to talk further, and if you have a reason to talk further, what you know what's the scale and scope of their problem and then just in your mind you're just very broad brush is this going to be a small is this going to be a medium is this going to be a large maybe it's going to be a super size maybe there's two or three options that you're just considering but you're not pitching anything you're not selling anything you're not making any offers so think of the sales process as four phases just like a doctor uh, initial diagnosis that's the discovery Diagnosis, prescription, treatment, 
outcome. When you go in and you start to pitch on that first meeting, you're starting with step three. You're starting with treatment. It's like, I got the product. I got the program. I got the service. I know what you need. Here's the red pills and the green pills and call me in the morning. You never ask, where does it hurt? How long has it been hurting? Does it hurt anywhere else? Has your wife noticed? Is this contagious? Are you starting to get red bumps or green bumps? Or, you know, you're just, you're just doing treatment and they're not, they, they haven't even fully articulated the diagnosis. And so that's sales malpractice, isn't it? That's the old cliche that treatment before diagnosis is malpractice, but it's a thousand percent true. And we don't spend nearly enough time in discovery. So when it comes time to write a proposal, if you end up writing proposals, I, I will sometimes ask clients, do you have enough information? Did, did they tell you enough so that you can write the proposal that is speaking prospect problems in prospect language? And they kind of look at me, Wes, like I've got three heads like, oh, that's how you write a proposal? I'm like, yeah, that's how you write a proposal. A proposal is not written. A proposal is listened to. And you are going to reflect their language, their vocabulary, their problems, their symptoms, their conditions, what they see as the outcomes and results. When they see a proposal that is in their language and that's a mirror of the sales conversation that you've already had, they're going to say, oh my gosh, Wes, this is perfect. This is amazing. This is exactly what we want. It's like, of course, it's exactly what you want because it's exactly what you said. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Tell people all the time, I mean, you, you should write fewer proposals, but close most of them. Yes. Amen. You know, you're, uh, I've got a client there in the tech space and in uh, all three of their inside salespeople are, are women. So, you know, we talk about quote monkeys, you know, and they I said, so you're not quote queens. Right. And they're like, oh, I love it. You know, dig in, ask more questions, stop just throwing crap against the wall and hoping that it sticks. And and, and it's hard sometimes. I mean, I, I've got a client right now. We were we were talking and uh they've been an ongoing client going back to last summer. And but in our early conversations, you know, she was like, Oh, well, go ahead and send me a proposal. Like she wanted to get off the phone, like just thought that was like the part of, like we we were wrapping up, send me a proposal. And we hadn't even talked about price. And I'm like, I said, well, hold on, you know, so we start talking about ballpark pricing, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about before we hit record. It's like there, there's a price, like there's a minimum, like just to get me out of bed. <laughs> right. So it's like, we're, I've got to at least be there. And then based on the issue, you know, I'm, the price goes up. And um, so I threw out some round figures and she was like, okay, that's fine you know, and, and she meant it. And, you know, so then I created the proposal with her language in that pricing. Uh, but it's like, I'm not so many people like, why are they afraid to talk price? And you see them like just belabored and, and losing sleep, taking a week to create some proposal with no idea on what the price should be. Why do people let that happen? Because people are nutty, Wes, that's why. And people <laughs> need you and people need me. So it's so <laughs> funny that, that you say this about the uh, the pricing. I I believe in the opposite end of the spectrum. So I've, I've got a client who I have trained to say the following line, because he does like these big kind of big leadership transformation type projects inside fairly good sized companies. I said, here's what you start to say early in the process, maybe even in the first conversation. After you've done some really good discovery and you've probed, you've uncovered, you've gotten through some of the self-soothing delusions and some of the BS that they're telling themselves. And so you hold the mirror up and you say, well, here's what I see, what's really going on. Uh, and, and here's the prescription, right? Your diagnosis prescription is this base here. And here's the quote. Based on everything you've shared with me so far, this is at least a six-figure deal. If that doesn't scare you, let's keep talking. Now, because he does a good job qualifying and he does a good job with that initial diagnosis, many of the folks that he talks to, the response to that line, Wes, yeah, that's what we sort of thought. Yeah, let's keep talking. 
No one is like, oh my God, I thought we could solve this for $3,000. So you need to be proud of your pricing. You need to be excited. People are like terrified. You're so right. They're terrified of like, oh my God, here comes the pricing part. Here comes the money part. I'm freaking out. I'm losing my mind. You need to be proud of your pricing. You need to be proud of the value that you deliver, which far exceeds the price that you're charging. But in order to set the context of value and the contrast of scale, right? Value is 10X, price is 1X or 2X. You have to have a meaningful, serious, deep, sales conversation about what the problem is costing them, not just in terms of dollars, but you have to bring in the dollars in terms of wasted time, wasted effort, rework, uh, employee retention, recruiting costs, whatever the problem is, technology costs, uh, technology waste, right? Man hours, people hours, percentages, uh, opportunities, profit margin, gross margin, net margin, whatever. So you need to have a business discussion. Sometimes we have a sales discussion. A sales discussion is about us and about our stuff. And very few prospects really care about having a sales discussion. When you have a business discussion, that is all about the prospect, their company, their goals, their desires, their team, their leaders, their strategy, their technology. And having a business discussion that ends in them realizing, oh my God, we need some help in this area. That's when you've earned the right to say something like, based on everything you've shared with me so far, this sounds like at least a six-figure deal, or you can say five-figure deal, You this at least 50K, you pick a number, whatever it is, but this sounds like it's at least fill in the blank. If that doesn't scare you, let's keep talking. And that shows your assertiveness and your professionalism. Do would a prospect just to save face roll with that, just to maybe try to get some free consulting out of it, then say no, or or does that kind of strike a chord and it's so unexpected you tend to get an honest answer? I think most of the time you get an honest answer, but then there's also, of course, our friend Robert Cialdini, right? The art of persuasion. Uh, there's this concept of consistency. So if early in the process, I told you, oh no, 50K is fine, 100K is fine. Later on, when I say, oh, Wes, we don't really have 50K. I lied to you. So they will, they will either find the money, they will reallocate the money. And there's a whole section, of course, in the Do It Selling book when you hit that budget question, that budget restriction question. So sometimes if you hit that kind of, uh, <clears throat> and you, pardon me, and you're, and you're getting some uh, nonverbal, some nonverbal cues that maybe that number is scaring them a little bit, but they're trying to save face. You can say, well, you know, I'm curious because we can obviously, we can put this in phases and stages. We can look at different payment options. I'm curious, what budget restrictions are you working with? And don't say, what's your budget? Say, what budget restrictions are you working with? Because that's going to give you the ceiling. So what they might tell you is, well, I mean, we're open to doing more, but we were initially thinking that this might cap out at 25K. So let's say that you've got a 50K overall solution. You say, well, would it be helpful if we did phase one for 25K and then we did phase two for 25K and then we just sort of space this out so that we can work within those budget restrictions? So that's another magic question is what budget restrictions are you working with? And they will give you the ceiling if there is a ceiling or they will say, you know what? Initially, we thought it was going to be 25K. But because of all this great dialogue, they're not going to say this out loud, but this is the, the end result. Because of all this discovery that you've done, they suddenly realize that it's like when you're tearing down a house or you're taking drywall off the wall looking for termites. The more you look, the more you find. And you just help them find a whole bunch of termites behind that wall. They thought it was going to be a 25K job. Now they realize it's a 50K job. And they're willing to go with you because they see the depth of the value that you're delivering. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. What budget restrictions 
that you're working with. I, I've always, uh, it's similar, but on the flip side, when they go, oh, yeah, I mean, budget's not an issue. <clears throat> and people, salespeople will think, oh, money's no problem. I'm like, those are not good things to hear. So I immediately, you know, I go and say, oh, so, so like 5 million bucks, like we can, we can roll with that and just like really like do a bang up job. Like, oh, no, I mean, no, not that. Oh, so there are some budget constraints. I mean, so 100,000, 50,000, I'll start walking them down and they, they'll eventually give me a number, you know, you, because you can't allow just this esoteric money's no issue. Um, so I'm, now I can bookend it. So I like that. I love that $5 million line. That's brilliant. Yeah. Oh yeah. You just others throw some big number out there, you know, <laughs> cause you gotta get them, you gotta get them to like physically, like they've been shocked. Oh no. <laughs> oh, and then I just act confused, <laughs> you know? And most of the time I'm not acting I'm like, what, what time is it? Where are we? Why is, right, this right. Why is that red light blinking at me? What the hell? Oh man. Well, you know so what? I Let me. I, I want to throw another gem out there when it comes oh, yeah, to, yeah. To, to negotiating. Uh, there's a whole section in the Do It Selling book about negotiating. But every time a salesperson hears negotiate or negotiating, they think it's negotiate down. I'm a big believer in negotiate up. So here's how to enter that conversation. Let's say you're approaching the finish line. And uh, typically a prospect, and it depends on their type of personality. Some prospects, they're always after a deal. No matter what it is, they could be buying a 50 cent pack of gum. They could be buying a $50,000 car. They're, they always need to have a deal. And you will hear, well, Wes, is that your best price? Well, Wes, is that negotiable? When I hear, is that negotiable? I say, of course it's negotiable. You know the old saying, everything is negotiable. But I'm curious, Wes, how much more would you like to pay? <laughs> So I'm, to, you know, let's negotiate up. So it's it's one of these things where you know can can we negotiate? And I've had a number of clients say that when they when they go into a conversation, they give them like a good, better, best, like three part proposal because they've done such a great job with discovery, because they've done such a great job expanding the gap between where that client is and really where they want to go at the end of the day and what the ultimate destination looks like, they will do a good, better, best proposal. And the client will come back to them and say, we have a problem. And it's like, uh oh, what's the problem? Oh my God, we have a problem. I, I think we need more than even the third option. I think we need more help than what you laid out in good, better, best. Is there something you can do above best, right? So let's say that your proposal is like 20K, 45K, and 70K. We're going to need, I think we need more than the 70K. Is there any possible way we can do more? Because they will then start to see we can go so much further. We can go so much faster. We can include more people. We can roll out this technology in a much bigger way. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate that you gave me 20 and 45 and 70. What's the option above 70? So do not be surprised when you hear we have a problem. It's not always a bad problem. Can we negotiate? It's not always negotiate down. It's negotiate up. Well, I'm curious, how much more would you like to do? How much more would you like to invest? And so yeah. that, that does two things. When someone says, is that your best price? Can we negotiate? Of course we can negotiate. How much more would you like to invest? So number one, they laugh like you and I are smiling right now. But it's a pattern interrupt, right? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I've never heard that from a salesperson. And it shows that you've got confidence and certainty that you are not going to be played with. You are not willing to bargain. You're not willing to drop your shorts for no reason. And there is more that you can help them with. Yeah, well, that's the old Reagan Mondale debate, huh? Yes, yes. I'm you and I are use... both old. You're both old, old enough to remember that line. <laughs> I'm not old. I'm just well read. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, because so it was yeah. the mod just for the for the young kids listening. Let me see if I remember this the same way you do. They're in a debate, and the moderator says to Reagan, "You know, your your opponent has brought up your age as a discerning factor between the two of you." 
Uh, Governor Reagan, would you mind? Would you, would you mind addressing that? He says, well, no, "I don't." I, th- I think he was president then. I think that was for the second. Oh, he was president. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, he right, he he beat Carter in the first one. So there this was, you go. This was eighty four in the reelection. See that you're getting the historical facts right. <laughs> and I think the the Reagan line is, "No, no, I am." I'm not willing to hold my opponent's inexperience against him. <laughs> and Mondale even laughed. And it was he done. He did. He did. It was done. It, it was done at that point. Slam dunk. <laughs> how much more are you willing to in the, how, how much more yeah. would you like to pay? And and what people probably don't realize is that Reagan, all these politicians, they have good teams and they they they're playing devil's advocate they are thinking and they sometimes they'll even hire an opponent to, that that doesn't like them but you know i get to their credit they're willing to you know i i could maybe go consult with my political opponent or a party i don't like if if i knew they were in power and they're probably they're going to have influence like, okay at least let me shape this as much as i can and and bring up the gotchas and the sticking points and and they rehearse those you know the old adage in law is you know a good attorney won't ask a question they don't know the answer to and so you know they did polls they did surveys man on the street blah 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 and they're like well we are reagan is like the oldest we are kind of worried about his age like how do we anticipate that how do we negate it uh but I see so many salespeople, they're just winging it. They're just, they're not thinking through, you know, the old adage is you can't read the label from inside the bottle. Yeah. Right. So they're just going in think, oh, we're the best. It's obvious you should pick us. And they're just cut down, you know, like bus sauce with questions they should have known the answers to. Yes. You know, like, why is that? Why are they running around so fat, dumb and happy? Well, it's almost like you're you're running an obstacle course and like every single day there's the brick wall, there's the, you know, there's the rope bridge, there's the all kinds of crazy things, you know, tree stumps, rocks, boulders, and every day you go out there and you're like, "Oh man, here's the brick wall again. Oh my goodness, here's that same boulder again." They don't bring rope, they don't bring a pickaxe, they don't bring dynamite, they don't bring you know, uh, heavy duty boots. They, they don't bring anything. And it's like, why am I hitting the same brick wall? Well, dude, next time bring the rope ladder. Well, why am I hitting the same boulder next time? Bring the dynamite, right? What can you do to anticipate, not even anticipate objections. What can you do in your strategic sales questioning like a lawyer? And we have even a section in the do it selling book. It's so funny. You mentioned the courtroom lawyer. We talk about cross-examination, that a good sales process is exactly like a lawyer cross-examining a witness and you do not ask a question that you do not want the witness to hear themselves say out loud in open court. So how can you prevent the objections? To, I mean, we all know what the objections are, Wes. I mean, we all do. Time, money, check with a partner, check with a spouse. Um, you know, we've tried this before. It hasn't worked. We bought a previous solution. That was a disaster. We've wasted too much money. It's not a good time. Seasonality. It's our busy season. You know, there's like nine, there's nine standard objections in the world. And every objection that you will ever hear is a variation of those nine. If you don't come prepared and you don't even dissolve those objections prior to asking for the sale, where there's like nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and it's kind of obvious that they need to hire you, that is the equivalent of showing up on the obstacle course with no equipment, no rope, no dynamite, no pickaxe, no boots, no nothing. So I don't know why people do it, but maybe they're lazy. And one of the things I really don't like, and I think you don't like it either, is lazy sellers. (laughs) Well, what do they say? Um, Two things that don't last very long, right? Uh, professional golfers that are constantly faced with six foot putts for par and lazy salespeople. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, man. Um, very cool. So did you did you have this trilogy in mind when you started or have things kind of 
doors been opened and the path, you know, kind of became obvious as you take each step? Great question. So the, it was not, it was not like George Lucas and the Star Wars movies. It was no great trilogy in mind from the outset. You know, I, I started my, my business, my practice when I was by myself, I started my practice as a marketing consultant. So I figured, well, let's write a marketing book. And then one of the best ways to market is speaking. So seven years later, after I was helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of speakers and coaches and consultants do lead generating speaking, paid professional speaking, keynote speaking, uh, you know, conference speaking, I figured, okay, let's write the speaking book. And then I realized, well, you know, about 30% of the do it marketing book was sales related anyway. And you can't really walk someone up to the front door, have them knock, someone opens the door, and then you don't tell them what to do after, you know, it's like, what happens when the dog catches the car? The whole point of marketing and the whole point of speaking is to generate leads, which you're going to have a sales conversation from. So then the natural extension three years later, which is right now, is we needed a sales book because all that marketing and all that speaking is not really great if you don't know how to sell. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always telling people to, to write, to create, you know, I've got a free program that's 12 weeks to peak. And it's just, I just give them a bunch of little tasks. And at first they are, they're big tasks because if you've never done it, it's, it's hard. But once you get in a rhythm, you know, I want them to write 700 words every day, write something, you know, and I, I tell them, write a book, oh, never in book. like title, sections, subsections, you know, it's like, come on people. It's, you know, I always use the analogy, you know, of a chiropractor, you know, it's like seven ways to, to address migraines without surgery or, or, you know, harmful prescriptive uh, pills. Yeah. Right. Like, what could you do? You know, stretch, sleep, hydrate, exercise. Like you should be able to brainstorm your topic like quickly. Yeah. Right. And then, okay, stretch. All right. I mean, good grief. Even if you don't know anything, I use chat GBT. What, go to Google. You can find 50 different stretches. Yeah. You know, so write a page on each of the stretches and then do it for the diet. And, you know, and then they slowly start to get it right. But it's like, you got to do a little bit of everything, but, you know, writing just makes you, it, it, it clarifies your thinking, doesn't it? It sure does. It sure does. In fact, that's one of the, that's one of um, my big mantras and why I also love writing and encourage my clients to write. Writing crystallizes thought, thought crystallizes action. Nice. Amen. So speaking of action, what action do you want our listeners to take? <laughs> well, I would love them to pick up a copy of the Do It Selling book, and I'll give you a couple of URLs where people can go. There's a whole bunch of free downloads, companion tools, resources, video training. If you go to doitselling.com, you'll see where you can pre-order the book and grab those free downloads and bonuses and companion tools. We also have a PDF manifesto that's absolutely free at doitmarketing.com slash manifesto. And then we also have our current on-demand web training is at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. So the book, the PDF, the training, all the bonuses, that's where people can just grab a hold of all this information and start to land better clients and bigger deals and higher fees. Very cool. So the book is live, um, what do we say, May 2nd? Yes. Right. Yep. So my goal, now you're going to make me stick to it. Or I can't, I can't be dilly dallying around. So I'm going to have to stick to my schedule for the next month and get this out on May 1st. So folks can jump right on it. Awesome. So Very great cool. to talk to you, Wes. I mean, yeah. dude, we, we could go on for hours and I have we to have could. you back on my show as well. Hey, you know what? When, when the, your top 75 people can't make it, you call me. I'm, I'm, I'm your, what, <laughs> What were we talking about before? What'd you call it? Backup quarterback. Backup, backup quarterback. backup quarterback. I wrote it on my notes over here. You think there I'm not paying go. attention? I'm paying attention, man. I love <laughs> it. All right. Well, great seeing you, David. Good luck on you the book. Too, my friend. Have a great day.